Um, how many people have been on an airplane recently? Flown anywhere? Janae Maurice have flown. You've been flying. Anyone else been on an airplane in the last <laughs> year or two? There's a lot of weird things about flying, isn't there? Yeah, there's some weird things about flying. Like, what's the deal about taking off your shoes, right? Like, that's a weird thing. If you just kind of took a step back, no, I know the reason behind it, but just go with me for a minute. So, everybody's going through security, and then all of a sudden, you're, everyone's taking off their shoes, and you're just kind of hoping and praying that you chose the right socks, right? Or if you have any socks on, because you're looking at everyone's nasty feet walking through the security line, and usually it's the dirtiest floor in the whole universe, and you're, you're really, I gotta take off my shoes, but, you know, it, that's a weird thing, and then you continue through security, and if you're like me, you want to be hydrated because you hate being dehydrated, and if you're lucky, you get one glass of water that's about this big on your six-hour flight, and so you want to buy some water, and how much does water cost at the airport? Six bucks. Yeah, like $20 for a, 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 you know, a bottle like this, and if you're anything like me, you buy it, you're like, oh, I thought about everything, and then you get into security, and then they confiscate your $20 bottle of water, and you're even more in a better mood, right? And then there's this weird message that every airplane, every culture, every language says as a part of their spiel, every flight attendant or steward or whatever the current political uh, correct term is uh, for those people, lovely people that are always so smiley, they always say this on their little intercom, they say, make sure in the event of a depressurization of the cabin that you put on your oxygen mask first, right? Now that's, that's a little bit weird, isn't it? Like, it's very kind of counterintuitive, especially if you've ever flown with a baby before. How many people have ever flown with a one-year-old or two-year-old or baby three-year-olds? Now, God help you, right? God help all the parents that have ever flown with a baby or a one-year-old or two-year-old. I remember one time, I'll never forget this for the rest of my dying days, that if I had to fly with my two-year-old one more time, I probably would rather walk back to Canada from Dallas. So it was, it's... I, I've got gray hairs that are still growing because of that experience, and I was the dad. I wasn't even the mom that was listening to that for four hours, like nonstop crying for both flights. And, and it was one of those crazy things, but you know, you're, you're beside your little infant baby whom you do everything for, right? You, if, you, if you're a mom today, wouldn't you do everything for your little baby? Yes. You would die for your baby, wouldn't you? Yes. How about dads? How many dads would do anything for your son or for your daughter? And so it's that, it's that experience where even if you're a dad and you've had no connection to your baby for nine months, it's weird because the, the moms have got the babies kicking, their hormones are changing, and even though they wouldn't really choose that, that's kind of the connection experience. But I've told so many dads that they're, they're asking me, man, is it kind of weird that I've got no connection with my baby? I'm like, no, you're totally normal. You know, they, they feel like they're a bad person, that they've got no emotional connection, and that's another message for another time. But... <laughs> Usually what happens for the dads is that as soon as that baby is born, what happens? They start weeping. That experience of seeing your progeny, right? Of your, your seed become a reality and you see and you smell and you touch your baby and you have that instant connection, that nine month connection that the mama said, suddenly within three seconds, you're a dad. And you look in those moments and there's something intrinsic as a dad, there's something intrinsic as a mom that you would do anything at any place at any time. You would die for your kids and do anything. And so when someone says to you, put on your oxygen mask first, there's something within you that says, that doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. Well, I did a little bit of research on that this week because I was kind of like, what's the deal with that, right? And so at 35,000 feet or 40,000 feet, when it is at a high pressurized situation, depending on how quickly they get the oxygen mask down and how quickly you can get it on, you can actually lose consciousness if you fumble around too long, if they wait too long. And so the idea is if you aren't conscious, you're not going to be much help to your infant. If you don't get your oxygen mask on, if you don't take care of your oxygen needs, then you can't help your son or your daughter or your spouse or someone sitting beside you. And there's so much in our culture today, isn't there, that this modern family, we live in 2017 where... They're saying that generations that used to be 20 years old now are more like five years. Within every five years, things are changing so rapidly. Technology is advancing so quickly. Information is spreading so far that things are changing so quickly that we have to, as parents, negotiate that. We, as, as spouses, we have to figure out what's it going to look like to, to do marriage, to do life in this modern life where technology is always on, where drive throughs and expectations are always about now. How, how, do we, how do we make sure that the things that are the most important stay relevant? Well, um, a couple of years ago, 
my kids got into hockey. It's because their cousin in Ottawa gave them a bunch of hockey cards. It's funny what gets your kids into stuff, right? And so they were trading hockey cards, and they were looking back and forth and trading things and looking at the stats, and my kids who didn't want to read a book suddenly were interested in reading. They wanted to know how many goals and how many assists and where they were born. And it's funny, that became the catalyst for them to say, Dad, I want to play hockey. And so, awesome, let's go play some hockey. And it's funny because within about two months, my kids started to work on something that they thought was the most important thing about hockey. They were in their basement with their little mini sticks and working on their hockey skills, and they're like, Dad, I can't wait till I get drafted by the Montreal Canadiens. I'm going to be in the first round draft pick. I'm going to make lots of money. But Dad, let me show you my goal celebration. Okay? So they started doing the PK Subban, like the double pump, like this. And here's the funny thing about that. They're three years old, five years old. They're working on their goal celebrations, but wait for it. They don't know how to stop yet. They're working on their goal celebration. They don't even know how to turn. They're working on their goal celebrations. They don't even know how to pull on their socks yet. And that's a little bit of an illustration. It's a little bit of an idea of sometimes of how we get things backwards in life. We, we get things backward that we prioritize the wrong things. And no matter where we live today with the information age and things spreading so quickly, the message behind the message out there as a parent today is that kids come first and kids come second and kids come third and fourth and fifth and sixth. And if you're lucky, and if you have a little bit of margin left, maybe you can look after each other, and maybe after that you can figure out what you need to do with your own time. But God's got a recipe for a kind of a happy home. God has always had a, a timeless recipe, a three-part recipe that will ensure that your kids and my kids will grow up in a secure and a safe and a thriving home. It's the way that we can make sure that we prioritize the main thing so that we don't miss everything. Because when we put the other thing first, we put the goal celebration before we can learn how to skate, we get everything wrong and ultimately we can't do what we ultimately want to do. So there was a, an author a couple of years ago, one of the most successful business books out there by Jim Collins. And he said it this way, he said, good is the enemy of great. Good is the enemy of great. Let's say that out loud. Good, Good is, is the, the enemy, enemy of great. great. Now he was a, a researcher and he was interested in what made Fortune 500 companies, the top companies, what made them successful? What made the best companies become more successful and what took a good company to become a great and thriving company? And in his research he said, you know, real simply, the reason why good companies don't become great companies is because they get content because they're not bankrupt, because they have a, a good sales force, because they have a decent stock price, because things are not going crazy. The reason why they don't become a great company is because things are okay. And the reason why we have good families and not great families is because we're content with the status quo. We're looking around and comparing ourselves with other families and other situations that are way more chaotic. And we're not willing to do the hard work to ask difficult questions to go where we want to go. And so, Good becomes the enemy of great in our families, in our companies, and even in churches. The reason why some churches are not become great churches is because we get content and complacent. And instead of reaching and going after the people that aren't coming, we, we start to turn inward and we just try to go through the motions of Sunday after Sunday. It's a challenge for all of us to, to choose to break through, to ask difficult questions, and to continue to push forward to have the kind of life that God wants for us. So... Let's just say, for example, that there's a young man, let's just call him for illustrations purposes, let's just call him this handsome man, this really talented guy named Chris, okay? I just pulled that name out of the, the air somehow. But let's just say that this guy is, he's a, you know, he's a 25 year old guy, he just left Ottawa, he just went to Dallas, and he's trying to do his life with God, and he's, he's trying to put his, he's prioritizing his relationship with God, and he's praying that one day that God would would have him meet the girl of his dreams, a, a royal princess, could I just say that? He's waiting for his princess. And so along comes, Anthony, thank you for being, let's give a round of applause to my assistant today, Anthony. Right, right beside there, Anthony, thank you. Along comes his princess, and they start to move together, they start to date and ask questions, Maurice, they start to go to coffee together, and they start getting some advice and they move a little bit closer together. They have a one of those big talks, like I was finding out 
couple days ago that Maurice had that talk with Janae, the fourth date into their relationship. So this guy was intentional right here. This is a, he, he knew how to date. He was, he was not messing around. He was like a shark going after Janae. Okay, I love that. By the way, Maurice, Maurice is one of those guys that uh, I miss this guy so much. And when I think about Maurice, you know that verse that says in the Bible that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. That's Maurice right there. You need to have good men in your life. Okay, so again, back to the story. I'm going to lose my life. It's so emotional to have my friends here. Okay, so they start dating, they get together, and then one day before a pastor and all their friends and their best friends, they say, I want to be married. I do, I do, I do. Okay, they get married. And they start to go on their honeymoon. They start to do life together, and they're still prioritizing the relationship with God. They're, they're in the Word of God. They're, they're, probably, they're putting their centerpiece around the church every Sunday. They're serving, and they're engaged, and they're doing all these things, and... And eventually what happens is as they get closer and closer, not to get too graphic, but they get really close. And, and they start to get really close uh, emotionally and physically in all kinds of other ways. And what happens is they start to multiply. Wow. These, this, two, this couple becomes three and four. And along the way somewhere, they, they multiply, they get some kids, and, and then little Johnny comes along one day, or maybe a little Sterling comes along one day and says, Dad, I want to play soccer. So, Anthony, would you be so kind as to bring the soccer ball here? So, the soccer ball represents soccer, and they're going to start soccer. Now, this is, this is a dream that, that Chris has had for his whole life, that one day he had a little little Chris that he gets to run after and put up those little shorts on him, and he fall all over the place, but he's been waiting his whole life to have a little Chris to be able to run around with, right? So, they get the soccer ball, they start going in the backyard, practicing, they sign up for a league, and... It's only a couple nights a week, so between 5 and 6.30 on Monday and Wednesdays. They go to the park, they kind of scarf down some dinner, they come home, they do the, the bath routine and the bedtime routine, and it's only two days a week. And then maybe a couple months later, little Sterling comes along and says, Dad, I would like to try some skiing. So, Anthony, would you be so kind to bring the skis over? Now, skiing's a bit more of a different commitment, uh, Janae Marie. So, you know, you have to... You gotta think about this for a while. Like you gotta pack up probably six SUVs worth of, of material to go skiing, right? Yeah, that's right? Skiing is awesome when you get there, but it is like three times the work to be able to get to the ski hill. Any, can I, am I saying anything I don't identify with, right? So you can see as you go skiing, maybe it pulls you away from a couple of Sundays at City Church. Not a big deal, right? You just go through a couple of lessons and then maybe you find some other families that are into skiing and you can kind of see that you go to the ski hill and it starts to sort of encroach a little bit more on your weekends. It used to be a downtime, but now it's a time where little Sterling gets to work on his skiing and you're still working on soccer. And then this crazy experience happens in, in Montreal where as a eight-year-old kid, suddenly you've got to start being laser focused about high school when you're eight years old. What high school are you going to put him in? What high school are you going to put him in? Are you going to give him this high school or that high school? So you better get him some tutoring because you want to make sure that little Sterling gets to be a doctor or a lawyer, right? You're a bad parent, right, if you don't do that. So let's bring over that bag to represent some extra tutoring that takes place, right? It's just a little bit of tutoring. Let's put that right over here, Anthony. Um, Thank you so much. You're amazing, Anthony. So you, you got to add a little books and you go to a little bit of after school tutoring and suddenly where you used to have your evenings free and your weekends free, suddenly it's starting to fill up, isn't it? It doesn't take long before now you're, you're committed on Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings and some weekends you're away for several weekends out of the year and you're still playing soccer. Now you started an indoor soccer league. And then around eight or nine, you start being invited to sleepovers. So let me bring over that sleeping bag if I could, Anthony. As you can see, as these activities, extracurricular activities, good activities, like everyone would say all these things are good things, exercise is good, and education is good, and relationships are good, and friendships are good, but good starts to become the enemy of the great. And where these two beautiful people, Chris and Yancey, were once so close, suddenly all these activities are pushing them further and further apart. And it happens just like that. Just as we talked about last week, it, talk, it happens with just one iPad. It happens with just one Candy Crush game. It happens with just adding another screen into your house. And if you're not careful, if you don't do a log of what's actually taking place, suddenly you look up and more and more time is being taken away from your family. More and more time is being taken away from you as spouses. 
And so again, God's got a recipe today that's going to help you if you're single and wanting to be married, if you're married and you want to have kids, or whether you're already in the midst of this experience. Now, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands of how many people are living this dream right now, right? Of, of feeling like you're a, a taxi service, of running from one activity to the end. And, and moms and dads, isn't it true that sometimes you wonder at the end of that day when you finally get your head on the pillow, have you ever had that thought that I'm doing all of this activity, but is it worth it? Have you ever felt so exhausted from getting your kid into this school or into that program or into this sport or into that sport, running from activity to activity and from work event to work event, and you wonder to yourself, what is this doing to my spouse? What is this doing to my soul? What is this doing to the margin that I used to have? And without us stepping back sometimes and asking those hard questions, and really thinking about what we're doing and the kind of kids that we're raising, we can end up further and further away from where we want to go. How many people have ever sw uh, swum in the ocean before? You've been in the ocean somewhere, somewhere in Florida or in the Philippines or somewhere across the world, you've been in the ocean? Well, here's been my experience, okay? So I love body surfing in the water. I know you can't tell with these amazing guns right here, but I'm, I'm an amazing swimmer. And that's it. No respect, Jay. Anyways, just kidding. Okay, so you, here's my experience. You put down your towel, you put down your flip-flops, you got your book, you, maybe you have an umbrella if you thought ahead. Now, I know you can't tell, but I really tan very well. You know, I've got that kind of skin that just really receives the sun perfectly. You know what I'm saying? It's more like lobster is kind of my color for the summertime. Anyways, so usually I forget the umbrella thing and I get charred and then I have to be outside of the sun for three more days to recover. But when I'm swimming, I go out into the water, and if you've ever swum when the, when the ocean is really active, you've got the waves are curling, and you've got the foamy waves happening, and the, the tide is strong, you swim for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and then you kind of, you, you've had a good swim, you kind of run up to the shore, and you look for your towel, and you look, and you look, and you look, and you're like, wait, that building wasn't in front of me when I put my towel down, where am I right now? And then you kind of jog up and down the walk of shame, you're trying to find your towel, and you realize you're about three or 400 meters away from where you started. That's a little bit of a picture of what happens in marriages. It's a little bit of what happens with modern families that if we're not careful, we get dragged by this tide, this pressure that moms and dads have to, to put our kids into all these activities, to, to not ask these big questions, but instead just to follow the rhythm of our city, to follow the rhythm of our of parents that we're neighboring with, of, of our friends' kids. And whether we're single or whether we're married with newlyweds, whatever this, this, the case might be, we get dragged away by the culture. And if we don't prioritize what's important, we can get further and further away from what God's recipe has been. So what is that recipe? Well, it's a three-step process. It's pretty simple, actually. The first is that God says that the way that you have strong kids is to have a strong marriage. But the way that you have a strong marriage is by each partner first prioritizing the relationship with God. Amen. So putting God first. This is how God says it in the book of Deuteronomy. Now Deuteronomy is an interesting book because it's kind of a summary book of what's taken place in the, in the land of Israel, the people of Israel, God's chosen people. And they've just been redeemed. They've just been freed from 430 years of slavery. They've lived in Egypt. They've gone through the horrors of slavery. They've prayed and they've waited and they've waited for somebody to rescue them. Well, God sent a, a rescuer named Moses. And through those 10 plagues, you know that God miraculously took them out of Egypt and into this brand new land that was about to be. It was an exciting time, a powerful time. And God said this. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be your father and you will be my kids. He says, I will be faithful even when you are faithless. And I will promise even when you break your promises. But here's what success looks like. Here's what success looks like as parents. Here's what success looks like as grandparents, as single adults. Here's what success looks like in your career, in your finances, in your home life. Here's what success looks like, period. He says in Deuteronomy chapter six, put God first. He says. These are the commands that you will enjoy a long life. Interesting. 
God says, I want to bless you with a long life. I want to bless you with a, a peace-filled life, a purposeful life. And he says, this is how it happens. Hear, O Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I want you to say this with me, okay? Verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your heart. This is called the Shema in Hebrew. This is the, this is the rallying cry for all Jews even today. It's been... Thousands of years, this has been the rallying cry of Jews. The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength. It was so important that Jesus repeated that in, in, in Matthew chapter 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength, and your mind. The idea is that when you put God first, when you prioritize your relationship with God, everything else falls into place. Amen. In fact, in another place in Matthew 6.33, Jesus said it this way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. Amen. So parents, you want to raise strong and successful kids? Single adult, you're, you want to thrive in your career. You want to have the kind of life that's filled with meaning and purpose and power. <coughs> you want to discover what it means to, to live life and hit on all cylinders, then, then seek God first. Put him first in your time. Put him first in your affections. Put him first in your ambitions. Put him first in your priorities, in your relationships, in everything you do. If you put him first, everything will fall naturally into place. You see, the message that we hear on Facebook, the message that we hear amongst the other parents of our schools, the message even of the education itself is the message that kids are first and second, and third. Everything is about the kids. But God says, if you don't put me first, you'll have no wisdom, no strength, Amen. no endurance, and nothing to offer your kids. Amen. Put me first. So let me give you a couple of checkups of how we're doing with this prioritizing of God first. So when you go to a dentist, they, they kind of ask you a simple question. Like, so cool. How many times a week do you say that you brush your teeth? And we all lie. We all say, well, <laughs> five times a day, probably. <laughs> and how many times would you say that you're, you're flossing? <laughs> At least six times a day. Sometimes seven, but you know, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes weekends, I get a little bit busy. Okay, so they're like, okay, well, uh, that's the nastiest mouth that I've ever worked on. But that's not true, but we'll just go with that. So, again, we, we, this is not new information. Many of you have heard this message. Many of you, if I said, what's the most important thing in life, you would say, of course put God first. This is not rocket scientist, right? But, so let me just give you a couple of diagnostic questions, again, to kind of see how we're doing with this. Where does, where does City Church fall within your priorities? When you think about Sunday mornings and you think about all the things that take place here, what, where does that fit into your priorities of your rhythms? Because, again, it's so easy for us to, to sign up for sports and activities and even sometimes just to sleep in and get rest. And all, that thing, all, all those things are great. But the idea of coming together and gathering together is something that is so important because you know why? It's because at least every day, maybe sometimes several times a day, I forget. And you forget. I forget who I am. To borrow the language of the Royal Conference, I forget that I'm connected to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. I forget that I'm forgiven. I forget that I have the power of God wherever I go. I forget that I am free to be exactly who I'm supposed to be. I forget that I have the wisdom of God available to me whenever I access it. And so this rhythm of coming together week after week is to remind us of the covenant that God has made with us. That even though that we let ourselves down and we let God down, Jesus has come through for us. Even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. So when you connect with God, when you think about between the Sundays even, what's your rhythm look like in order for you to prioritize your time with God? 
in the midst of pressures raising toddlers, in the midst of a boss that you don't like, or a job you don't like, or finding yourself in a financially strapped situation, how do you make sure that you connect with God and don't let worry dominate your countenance? How do you make sure that you remember that God is in control when it feels like the world is out of control? Jesus had a lot of rhythms, and one of his rhythms was relationships. Jesus had best friends, Peter, James, and John. He had the three. Jesus had the 12. Jesus had the 70. And so as we think about people that we help us connect with God, because even Jesus didn't do life alone, who are the people that you're intentionally sharing life with? At City Church, we say often that we exist to share life and to shine light, that our lives are better when we share life together. The highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, the challenges and everything in between. And as we do that, we make an impact in our neighborhoods, in our city, in our country, in our world. So when it comes to prioritizing relationships with people that you're sitting around or people that are going in the same direction as you as parents or as single adults or people trying to find the way of God, do you have a rhythm, an intentional rhythm of connecting with people beyond your family? So God says that my recipe is first of all to, to put me first, but secondly, in Genesis chapter 2, we see that the marriage is supposed to be second. Genesis chapter 2 says, The Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And so that's why these chairs were so close together. God's math for marriage is that two different people, two different temperaments, two different family backgrounds, two different sets of gifts, two different sets of outlooks on life, they come together and miraculously by the power and the grace of God that they start to become one. And that oneness is not just sexually, although that's a big part of it, it's one emotionally, Amen. it's one relationally, it's one spiritually, it's being of the same mind. It's moving in the same direction. It's, it's again aligning priorities, aligning your budget, aligning your plans, aligning your ambitions into one direction. And that takes work. So God says, if as you seek me first, everything else will be added unto you. I had the privilege of, of doing the premarital counseling for Janae and Maurice and many of you here today. And one of the most powerful illustrations of this principle is that in marriage, if you can picture a triangle with God being at the top, the apex of the triangle, and then a spouse being on this side of the triangle and a spouse being on this side of the triangle. Can you picture that? Yep. An equal lateral triangle, Janae. <laughs> Is that right? That's fancy. Yeah, yeah. I, I whipped that out of my fifth grade education. So, anyways, triangle and God's at the top. So this is what we. This is my encouragement to myself. And when I am seeking God, when my eyes are upon God, my eyes are upon Jesus. When I'm accessing the power of the Holy Spirit, as I'm getting closer to God, and Yancy's getting closer to God, what's happening in our distance? Getting closer. Getting closer together. You guys are smart mathematicians. Is that true? <laughs> that we start very far apart. And this is just not, again, this is so simple that we can miss it, but at our base level, when we wake up in the morning, is your first, is your first inclination to say, I can't wait to do everything in my power to serve my wife today? Or is it, I'm going to need about four espressos and only if my hair is looking good and I feel good and my kids aren't yelling and I've got nothing to do today. Then maybe I'll, I'll think about that. But our first inclination when we wake up in the morning is about how I feel, what I am doing, what my schedule is like, and what I want to do. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. I'm trying to get people to like agree with me, Janae, but it's not, it's not working. It, it takes a while, doesn't it? It takes a while to get that going. So it, it's just me, apparently, up here without an admission. But isn't it true that a God-centered marriage takes God? That's a simple thing. Because 
if I'm not connecting with God, if I'm not prioritizing time with God, then I don't have the ability to extend forgiveness because I think it's all about performance. And without God being the centerpiece of my marriage, we get into a performance contract with each other. We forget that the language of marriage is actually a covenant. It's the same language that God used with us. Even though you fall down, I will be faithful. Even though you're faithless, I will be faithful. Even though you're not meeting my needs, I will be faithful. That's what marriage is supposed to look like. But if I'm not getting that from God, my identity, my security, my strength, my wisdom, my ability to forgive and to receive forgiveness, then instead of offering that to my spouse, I'm letting bitterness grow. And I'm letting darkness grow. And I'm letting distance grow. And it's, it becomes, what are you doing for me? Instead of, how can I serve you? And so, I kind of joke with all the prospective husbands as I'm doing marital counseling. And I said, guys, you probably have the easiest job description in the world because your example is Jesus Christ. And, you know, I mean, he's a pretty average guy, right? We could all meet up to the standards of Jesus. Just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands... Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, sometimes we have that language and we don't really think about what that means. So let me just break it down for you. How did Jesus love the church? Did Jesus just write it in the sky? Did he send a Hallmark card? Oh, church, I love you. Did, did he just hashtag it? I love you. No. Um, just, again, to, to, to bring it down to an ordinary level, Jesus willingly and sacrificially, he went to a cross. And he paid with his life for our freedom. He paid with his life to bring a brand new relationship out of nothing into an existence. God has created two things. He's created the family and he's created the church. Two sets of families. It's interesting, isn't it? The only two things that God has ever built, he's built a family, a family became a nation, and then in the New Testament he built the church. And in that church it's supposed to be just like City Church. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every background are unified in Christ. That's beautiful. But if we're not careful, if we don't seek God first, and if we don't put Him in front of our marriage, then quickly we become competing and dominating and looking for ways to get ourselves fed instead of fed by God. So God says, put me first. Put the marriage second. Now let me, let me ask you a little checkup here. This might be get a little bit personal here, but spouses of kids, let's say that you have a couple of little guys running around, or maybe some teenagers running around. But if that's your situation, when's the last time that you had a date night with your spouse. Now I can say this because I can proudly say that I had a date last Friday. Now just to keep it real, I hadn't had a date in several months. So this, is, this message is for me. Because so often in marriage what happens? We romance each other, we send poems to each other, we, we send little thoughtful gifts to each other, we, we kind of look at it as like a, a game, right? Like, uh, let's, let's see how romantic I can be, let's see how much of a servant I can be, let me think about the, the best and the wildest things that I can ever do. And then once we get married, we're just kind of like, man, I'm just going to chill for a little bit. Let's see, I put my feet up for a minute. And, and we kind of almost like retire our dating jersey, right? And we just say, well, that was, that was sweet. Let me just put those back in the drawer. And again, we look up months or sometimes years later, and the distance between us has become wider and wider and wider. And we forget that what we use to get our spouse is what we need to keep our spouse. And so being intentional with our time to, to carve out time where we're not talking about our kids together. When's the last time you were on a date and the only thing you could say to your spouse was, wow, this is really good. Or pass the water. Remember that scene in Batman, the original Batman, the best one with Michael Keaton and Kim, Kim Basinger? Remember that? And they're, they're in his like, they're in his like ama amazing mansion and, and Alfred brings their food and they're at this amazing dining table like seated for 40. And Michael Keaton's on one side, and Kim Basinger's at the far end. They can't even carry on a conversation. Like, how's the food? And like, there's an echo in the room, and what? You know, 
and that's a bit of a picture of the drift that takes place between spouses when we don't prioritize romance with each other and surprising each other, that we kind of drift further and further and further apart. Now, there's a lot of single parents in the house. Let me give, let's give a rounding, a huge round of applause for all of our single parents today. A couple of times a year, Yancy wants me to remind her how, how valuable she is, so she leaves me for at least a couple of weeks. And I get to be a single dad, and I gotta tell you that it is amazing. I love it, it is. And then I think about all the single moms out there, and the single dads out there, doing it day after day after day. And so you guys are my heroes. You guys are so amazing. And, but, but let me just encourage you with this. You can have a date too, and you have to have a date. There's, there's gotta be time, a couple of times a month, where you carve out time for yourself. That if you don't have anything where you're looking out to yourself, you're replenishing your energy stores. And I know that guilt is so strong, whether you're married or single. That guilt to always think about your kids first, second, and third. And at the end of the day, if you're not prioritizing time to replenish your soul, then you have nothing left to offer your kids. So single moms, when's the last time you just dropped your kids off with a friend and said, I'm going to go with my girlfriend and go out for dinner? Or I'm just going to go to the park, or I'm going to go on a walk that replenishes me. That Just encouraging you to, again, to prioritize your health and your soul. Time alone with God. Time for you to just re replenish your energy stores. So God says, put me first. And then the marriage comes second. And out of that relationship, God multiplies and brings children. And kids come third. Yeah, kids come third. Again, not a very popular message. <laughs> Continuing on in Deuteronomy 6, it says this, to take these commandments, loving the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and strength, talking about all of God's miraculous deeds, and he says this, impress all of these upon your children. Now listen to the intentionality of these verses. Intentionality. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. God is saying that it's not realistic for you to sit down with your six-year-old and your four-year-old and say, tell me about Ezekiel and what you find is the true message of that book. <laughs> let's sit down for 30 to 45 minutes. Let's have a Bible study together. Now God's saying that that's not going to work, but here's what will work. When you're walking your kids to school in the morning and you see a bird or you see a freshly fallen snow with no tracks in it, can you, can you just spend a minute just saying, isn't God beautiful? Yes. That God would design this for us. When you pick up your son from school and he's had a, an incident with a bully, maybe that's a teachable moment for you to talk about forgiveness and talking about how Jesus was bullied and how Jesus was willing to to be bullied in order for us to bring freedom. And that the best thing that we can do as followers of Jesus is to extend grace and is to turn the other cheek when everything in our power would want to retaliate. There's a resource that we talked to you about a couple of weeks ago during our Kids Takeover Sunday called leadershipforkids.com. And you can, you can just go to that website on your mobile device, on your iPad, on your computer, and you can just choose an attribute. Maybe it's generosity. Maybe it's sharing. Maybe it's courage. And I would just encourage you that maybe one Wednesday a week or a Tuesday night, whatever works best for your schedule, just choose one. And together you would talk about that for five or ten minutes while you're eating together. Be intentional. Use those opportunities, those teachable moments as you're driving, as you're walking, as you're putting your kids to bed. That you wouldn't just let and download your education of your kids on City Kids once a week. That you wouldn't just outsource the spiritual education of your kids upon City Church, but that you would take an active role and try to ask and answer the question, what do my kids need to know about their world and their experience today? How can I, how can I connect them to the living God in the midst of a frenetic and busy and chaotic world? So, how are we doing with that? How do you point your kids to God in the midst of a busy schedule? Well, as we close, the main idea is this. Strong kids come from a strong marriage. 
And a strong marriage comes when both people are actively pursuing God. But let me say a moment about the most famous word in the Christian vocabulary. The word is grace. Now this is a proverb, which in all the proverbs in the Bible are generally to be true. Which means that if you follow them, generally speaking, these will be true. But Yancey, for example, is a product of grace. And I am a product of grace. And you are a product of grace. None of us grew up in perfect homes. Yancey grew up in a single parent home. And as she was 10 years old, her parents divorced. And in the, the pain of that, in the frustration of that, in the questions that emerged after that, she talked to her granddad and she said, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I've lost my dad, I don't even know where he is. I, I don't know what to do, what, my life is ruined. And her grand, granddad said something so wise to him, I wanna repeat it to you. He said, Yancy, I'm your granddad and I'm always gonna be there for you. But even when I can't, there's a heavenly father. There's a God in heaven who loves you and cherishes you and will go with you wherever you go. And he is the God of grace that will fill in the cracks for everything that's been done to you that's not been right, everything of unmet expectations, anything that's happened that you can't control, God is a God of grace. Isn't that good? Amen. And so I, wanna, I don't want us to miss this. Even if you are a spouse and you have your spouse sitting next to you and you're raising kids and you're doing your best, can I just remind you, that we serve a God of grace. He is not a God that expects perfection and that he loves your kids far more than you and I will ever love our kids. And he's watching over us and he's saying, great job. You got up today, you got lunch out the door. I give you a high five from heaven. <laughs> because we beat ourselves up and we think to ourselves, we're not good enough, we're not strong enough, we're not this, or we're not blank enough. And God wants to remind you today that he is the God of grace. And whether you're raising your children with your spouse or without your spouse and you're by yourself, God will fill in the gaps for you. Just as he did when he went to the cross for our brokenness and the things that's happened to us. And he is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. Amen? Amen. So as we close, the way that we can get our families back, get our marriages back, and put our kids on the path of success is to put God first seeking him, prioritizing him, and using this family as an extended family to go to places that we can't go on our own. And even when we don't have the strength, and even when our wisdom falls, falls short, and even when we mess up and we mess up again and again and again, Jesus is just holding out his hand to you and saying, will you trust me? Will you let me fill your cup today? Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to call you Father. You are a relational God. You put us into your family by the, the death of your son, your only son, Jesus, who died sacrificially so that we could be grafted into your family that we would never deserve. Thank you for the single moms and the single dads right there. I pray that you would touch them with your wisdom that you would remind them, even in this moment, Lord, that they are exactly enough. In fact, that they have, you would choose nobody else to raise their kids for them. Father, I pray that you would bless them with wisdom, with energy. And Father, for those of us that are thinking about marriage, God, I pray that this wisdom would serve us well, and that we would put these practices into our routine, and into our thinking, and into our schedules, that we would prioritize you above everything else, and that as we do that, that you would show us that everything else will fall into place. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who said grace to us, extended grace to us, and continues to offer us his grace day by day. And we're thankful for that. In your name.